Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Amen. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. The opportunity to open the word together as a family. What we want to hear tonight is really you speaking to us. We want not just to hear the word, we want to be obedient to the word. We ask that you would teach us to walk in that straight and narrow path. That you would help us stay right in the middle of your love. That we could be used by you that we could experience you. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. If you remember last week, we were looking again at one of the visions of Daniel. And Daniel, again, became a prophet in this second half of the book of Daniel. In the text, the original text was in Hebrew. Very significant because it means it's speaking to the Jewish people that they would understand it. The first part of the book, if you remember, was in Aramaic. It was the common language, Babylonians, Egyptians. Uh, but again, anyone that was in that area that would travel along that road would know that language. It meant that that primarily was about the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. And we saw that it, what it was doing is predicting history. And when we look back, we see the history is 100% accurate. But as we come to chapter 8, we're going to see again the second half, verses 15 through 27, is really the interpretation of Daniel's vision, the second vision. Now, he's not able to interpret on his own. He, he has to seek knowledge. There are many today that believe that they see a vision and they're so sure what it means. And there's a real big red flag that goes up. Because oftentimes those things that they're saying don't line up with the very nature of God and they don't line up with the word of God. Because God has already told us the future. As again, as we've been going through this book, we see that he is the author of history. He's in control of history. And, and Daniel, one of the main focuses in Daniel is, a, is really the sovereignty of God. That he's in sovereign control of every event. Nothing surprises him. And that everything that occurs has a purpose. And he uses it for his glory. Well, look with me in our text tonight. It's in verse 15. We see, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the canal. And he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man understanding of this vision. Now, one of the things that we're going to see in these first few verses here is really who is the identity of this angel. We're going to talk about it. Angels, for example, always are presented in the Bible in a masculine form. Angels are spirits, and this is important to understand. Angels do not naturally have bodies. They have to manifest themselves into a body. The real person that is, you know, that has been born again is, is a spiritual being. God is spirit. God doesn't have a body. God doesn't have a hand. He relates to us in a way that we have hands. When he says the right hand of blessing is upon us, it, it, it means that he's keeping us because that would be the hand that you would shake with. It would be a hand of encouragement, a hand of help. But God is spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. They, they do not have bodies. And angels were just created beings, but they're spirit beings. So it says, when Daniel, when I, Daniel, seen the vision or saw the vision, he sought to understand it. Now, we can sometimes say dreams and visions are the same. Sometimes people like to liken visions to those when a person's alert, attentive, not sleeping. 
but sometimes they're one and the same. It's God's way of speaking to you and me. But understand this, the devil, while we don't need to worry about him, greater is he is in me than in the world, the devil can put thoughts in your mind. The devil can put thoughts in your mouth. And you'll either yield to God or you'll yield to the devil. And the devil can fill your mind with what seems to be a vision. People are oftentimes looking for a sign. You know, God's lead. Satan can also give you a sign. And God allows that to be a test for you. Will you listen to him? Will you compare it in light of God's word? What he's already showing you? So Daniel seeks to understand. The, the understanding is not within himself. Now, so again, when he says, Behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. He's describing this angel, Gabriel. And we'll talk more about him in a second. And he heard the voice. The voice of a man between the banks of the canal. Now, this is where Daniel's standing, but, but this voice, and you're going to have to pay attention, is really the voice of God telling Gabriel how to minister to Daniel. Now, angels, please understand that, are ministering spirits. They minister to God, yes. But they're, in Hebrews, it talks about they were created to minister to those who inherit salvation. Is that you? And this is one of the ideas and where we get the idea of a guardian angel. Anyone have a guardian angel? I think I probably got about 50 or 60. I get in trouble a lot in the past. Give those guys a hard time. But God knows our needs. Now notice again it says in that verse, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man understanding. And we're going to see in the next chapter, chapter again nine, that Daniel is praying, and when Gabriel is sent down to minister again, to Daniel, that time, there's going to be a spiritual warfare, a fighting of angels, a spiritual battle in the skies. If we could only peel back for a moment to see the battle going on, you wouldn't want to see it anymore. A battle for your mind, your heart, because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So this voice that we see is really demonstrating the superiority of God over the angel. He's the one that guides. He's the one that directs. And I'll show you some verses in a moment that, that people kind of get mixed up. So Daniel was watching this vision. He obviously was experiencing a difficulty when he's seeing this vision and trying to understand it. Possibly because neither the Persians nor the Greeks were Powerful at the time of this vision. So Daniel's given information 400 years before it even happens. It's like, how can this be? It's puzzling. It's hard for him to understand. And it shouldn't surprise us that sometimes it's hard to understand when we're reading the Word. But when God wants you to know what the Word of God says, guess what? He's going to speak. He'll speak an impression in your mind or he'll speak through an angel. Now again, suddenly this personage appears. This is Gabriel. All of a sudden it's just here. Wouldn't that be amazing if just here there's a person? I think I described recently one time we were doing a, a Sunday night, an afterglow type situation and there would be a plane of music and there'd be a kind of a pause and a reading of prayer, maybe a, a word of knowledge, just a reading of scripture. And the worship went on. And there was a person that came in. We didn't know who it was. We're, we're focused up on the Lord. But you know when somebody walks past you, you're, even with your eyes shut, you're just kind of where somebody goes past you or near you. And this person sat in the back and it was kind of wrapped around the area where we're sitting. 
And as we begin to sing, this person behind us, whoever it was, sang in like three-part harmony. You know, it's like three or four people back there singing together, praising with this God. And at the end, when we came to prayer, we all kind of turned around to look, and there was nobody there. We pondered, we wondered, was it an angel? You could entertain, you have to be careful, you might be entertaining angels, Hebrews says. But it couldn't have been just one person. I say this to say this, God loves to reveal his presence there, his hand upon every situation. He always meets you in those low times or the mountaintops. Someone comes in and they dump the dump truck of problems on you and and he has a way of balancing it out. We just need to remember he'll never leave us or forsake us. So Gabriel has this message. He's to to give Daniel. We're going to see this, especially when we get to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, some of the most important verses in understanding prophecy. Again, as I mentioned before, it's, it's in that passage, the very day that Jesus would come riding in a donkey in Jerusalem is predicted in that passage. But before he could even give that message or this message, there's a, a spiritual battle going on. God wants us to hear his word. Now, Gabriel and Michael are the only two angels that are mentioned by name in the Hebrew Bible. Now, there's the book of Topid. It's, again, a book that's kind of added. It's, it's, it's more of a history book. You'll find it in the, in the Catholic Bible. It mentions one, Raphael. But in what we know is the text, the 66 books, two angels, both Michael and Gabriel appear in the oldest list of archangels. And these are the ones that ministered. Worship leader was Satan. We know that. He was an angel, but a fallen angel in that case. But we don't know his real name. But in the book of Enoch, and other books like that, you'll have many different angels. The emphasis is not on the angel. The emphasis is really upon the sovereignty of God over these angels to direct them for your need, my need, or his son's need. And they're there, watching over you day and night. Names of angels were very proliferated during the Hellenistic period of time. When I talk about the Hellenistic period of time, the the influence of the Greek culture came in, mysticism came in, still affecting the culture. And they brought in their different gods, There's no evidence, however, that these names are in fact older than the Hellenistic time of all these new names and everything. Now, I want to read from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We won't look at a, a lot of side verses tonight, but understand there's certain key ones I want you to grasp. This is God after he spoke long ago to the Father's And in the prophets, in many portions, in many ways, these last days he's spoken to us in his Son, whom he's pointed at heir over all things, through whom he has made the world. He is the radiance of the glory, the exact representation of of his nature, and upholds all things by his word of his power. He has made purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And having become much better than angels as he inherited a more excellent name than them. And the reason I read this is because Hebrews is written by a Hebrew to a bunch of Hebrews quit being Hebrews. And what they were doing is exalting at the time of Christ and after Christ, exalting these angels over the top of Jesus Christ. And this is one of the reasons this is written. How does God speak to you and me today? Through Jesus Christ, through the living word. 
And so we don't need the, the prophets of old. We don't need angels, yet God uses angels. But sometimes people worship the creation rather than the creator, sadly. Daniel chapter 9, verse 21 says this, While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision previously, talking about this vision, came to me in extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. They were praying three times a day. There was a battle going on, as I mentioned earlier. Wearied from that battle. He's usually assumed to be, a, again, a, a revealing angel. We'll see that when we get to Daniel chapter 10. And, and then in Luke chapter 1, verse 19, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and bring you the good news. And this was, again, the revealing of Jesus Christ. The gospel. Jesus is the gospel, the good news to this world. And Luke 1, 26 announces the, the birth of John the Baptist, where he tells Mary that her virgin-born son will be conceived again. And he tells Mary as well, I should say. And the Holy Spirit overshadows he reveals. But see, all that revelation has been recorded here for you and me. And yet there are many that are following angels today. And angels are bringing deceptive messages. And the many of the cults have these angels of different names. In another gospel, which is not a gospel at all. Now the name, again, Gabriel usually understood as a, a man of God, but is better taken to be God is my hero or warrior. The angel looked up to God. And this is significant because people are looking up to the angel. And when angels appear, they're just servants of God like you and me. They're more powerful than you and I are. They have their place. They're ministering spirits. But they're only angels. And this is important to remember. Look at verse 17 with me. So he came near where I was standing. And when he came, I was frightened and I fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. So this is talking really about the end times. Now remember, there's a prophecy, again, that's called the near and far. Some people use that terminology. Or a double fulfillment. And that double fulfillment means this, that, that the things that are said, you will see them partially fulfilled. And it's really kind of a picture of what is going to come down the road, but it's going to be much worse down the road. And so when he's describing this, all the, that's the vision is, is, the, is the near things. But he's really talking, the main part of this talk is the end of time. Now when did the end of times come? It's when Jesus Christ came into this world, when God became flesh and dwelt among men. It's been approximately 2,000 years. God's patient, long-suffering, wishing that none perish. But as you look around, the world is continually getting worse, spinning out of control. The world is much like what it was when he, God destroyed it the first time with a flood. Man is continually thinking on evil all the time. And you've been snatched out of the miry clay. You've been snatched out of the fire before the fire ever went. God has opened up your eyes. Now, Gabriel, Gabriel approached Daniel to interpret the vision, but the prophet was frightened. And I think this is really a normal situation. He recognized there was something supernatural. This is not an ordinary man. He was like a man. The voice was like a man. But this was not the norm. And with everything that was going on in his vision, he was frightened and I think this is the normal response. 
Now be very careful because a lot of people get very arrogant. Well, I would have talked to that angel. And I would have done that and like heck you would. I think all of us would have fallen down. Immediately the angel began to explain the vision which would reassure Daniel again, this is important, that there's no reason to be alarmed. You know, we should not be alarmed over the future. Because our future is secure and we know how this book ends. Our concern, though, is for those that we love, those that we know that are lost, that will be separated from Christ for all eternity. And that should be the motive for us to tell others. Now, Gabriel referred to Daniel as, notice the son of man. Hebrew is Ben-Adam. The phrase emphasizes Daniel's weakness in mortality. We are really weak. We are helpless apart from God. You can do nothing apart from God. He is the one that holds all things together by his breath, by his word. Apart from him, we can do nothing. He's the one that gives us the strength. He's the one that gives us the favor in our jobs. He's the one that gives us the wisdom and the knowledge. But in reality, we are weak. Jesus will use this phrase, the Son of Man, speaking of really his humanity. Jesus was fully God and he was fully man at the same time. And that's a beautiful picture. God had to become man and he he was the kinsman redeemer in order that he would go to the cross. He would be that sacrificial lamb. He was a man with no sin, the only one in this world that never, ever sinned. And that was a requirement, a sinless lamb. Yet he was God at the same time, and he laid aside his supernatural power and deity, and the miracles he did, he did by the Spirit of God. He shows us how we can go through this life trusting and resting, going to the Father and getting direction each day. Helpless, dependent. How to overcome the temptations by the word of God. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel they use this term 93 times. It has the same meaning. Now according to the heavenly message in verse 17 it says, understand that this vision pertains to the end time. And this is really not surprising because the events is predicted around him. It's the sixth uh, through the, again, the second century B.C. do not appear to be the end time events. At the moment, it may seem that way. But when you look back, we're still here. And those things foreshadow the things that are going to come. Kyle says this, the time of the end and the general prophetic expression for the the time is a a period of fulfillment. And it's it's important to understand lies in the end of the existing of the prophetic horizon. The present case was this man Antichus. Antichus. I'm struggling with that name tonight again. But he says... Antichrist, not the Antichrist. The things that, that occur, the things that are mentioned, they, they so line up with so many other places, but this is not the end. God is allowing them to get a, a glimpse of what it's going to be, that they needed to take their faith seriously, because we're only man, and the days are short. As I study the scripture, I understand that this prophecy meant to have a double fulfillment, as I mentioned, or the near and far foreshadowing what is going to come. And none of us want to to be there. Look with me in verse 18 of our text. And now, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face in the ground. 
And he touched me and made me stand up. The weight of this prophecy, in light of everything he's seen, is so overwhelming. You ever been in that place where you're just so overwhelmed? The weight of the situation is so much. This is where Daniel's at. <coughs> Except for he, he, he believes this is the end of the time. And is it now? Is it what? He doesn't understand fully. But it's too much for any one man to bear. So the angel touched him, made him stand upright. And he said, behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur in those final period of the indignation. For it pertains to appointed time of the end. You know God's right on time? We're the ones that are usually late for an event. I hope you're not late for the rapture or some other event. But his schedule is perfect. There's this time of Gentiles that needs to be fulfilled. There's people that still need to be saved. I like what D.L. Moody once said. Theologically, probably not sound. He says, uh, Lord, save your elect and save some more. And that's what it seems like God is being so patient because he wants to see more people saved. Just as when Christ had came into the world, this is so important to understand, all of these events were preparing the world for the Messiah to come. Roughly 400 years later, the Greeks would conquer the world, Alexander the Great, the Romans would, and then they bring the Greek culture, the Greek language. The Romans then would bring peace, and then the roads, they could go safely. The gospel could go everywhere. It could begin in Jerusalem and go to the outermost parts. Of the earth. God has a plan for every little event, and you're part of that big picture. And you're very important, each and every one of you. There's a part to play. Now, Daniel didn't respond, if you notice. He simply fell on his face and went into this deep sleep, almost like a a coma. Too much to bear. But Gabriel lifted him up, as we saw. It's so important, with a mere touch. We often forget that angels are much stronger than you and I are. Now, there are good angels and fallen angels, and I've known people, they're always wanting to take on demons. They think they're demon busters or something. And they're more powerful than you and I. And the best thing you and I can do is go seek first the kingdom of God. His righteousness, he'll add all things. He'll take care of all things. Resist the devil, he'll flee. We don't need to, to focus upon the devil. When he's there, whenever God is moving in your life or the life of someone else, Let me tell you, the the demons are there. But our focus must rest upon Jesus, what God is doing. Because everything else becomes a distraction from what you are called to do, what I'm called to do, and maybe to share the gospel with one individual. Or be like the story of the Good Samaritan and go and minister to someone's hurt. Well, again, he wanted Daniel to be alert. He wanted Daniel to hear the explanation. And God wants you and me to hear, not just with our mind, with our hearts, to be moved by what we see as the future, to share with others. And he wants us to be alert every day. That maybe this is the day that the Lord has come. Maybe this is the last day this person or that person will ever have an opportunity to hear the gospel or for you to even share that gospel with someone else. Today is the day of salvation. So he explains what the coming, again, of these latter days, this indignation is about. His wrath against Israel that is sent into exile. And Gabriel repeated it at the appointed end of time. You know, some people think this world is just going to go on and on and on. 
Some people think they're going to inhabit this world and they're going to make it all better. But it's going to come to an end when you read Peter. When you read the book of Revelation. And either way, you and I, our lives are limited. Maybe you started poorly like me, but let's finish the race well. Let's bring as many people with us as we can. Look with me in verse 20. It's about the two-horned ram. It says the ram which you saw with the two horns represents again the kings of Media and Persia. We have no question really of the, the meaning of this vision because Gabriel explained it in plain, simple terms. So simple kids can understand. Now, it's this passage that many people say, well, this was written after the time that they were countries. It couldn't be written before. No one can do that. Follow some good archaeology and how they, again, just come up and show that the Bible is true. Archaeology, biblical archaeologists, they take the Bible, they read it, and they know where to dig. They know what to find. And it's amazing. And the world will say, no, no, no. Well, again, the two-horned ram represented the kings of the kingdom, the Medes and the Persia. One was stronger than the other. And the Persians become the strongest ones. Now in verse 21, about the one-horned goat, it's the shaggy goat, represents the, the kingdom of Greece. And a large horn that is between his eyes is is the first king. In verse 22, in the broken horn of the four horns that arose in that place represent the four kingdoms which will rise out of this nation, although not with his power. See, it represents Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great dies at 32 years old after conquering almost the whole world. And how did he die? A fever. A cold. Some say it was malaria, but no one knows. Some would say it had to be poison. Because the men that he had taken had traveled with him and conquered around the world for eight years, and they would not seen their homes. Several times they began to rebel and say, no, we're not going to go any further. And Alexander would have to back off. Now remember, God's in control. God limits how much evil and what could happen. And everything that happened, God used for good. Now the goat is described further as shaggy, represents the king of Greece. We mentioned again, that's Alexander the Great. He, he became this, this leader at 20 years old. Fierce, mighty, seeking revenge with the Persian Empire because they had come in and conquered again Greece several times. The four horns we talked about last week replaced, again, Alexander the Great. Four kingdoms. But there's one kingdom that really will stand out, we'll see in a second. Verse 23, the latter period of their rule. And when the transgression had run the course, the king will rise insolent and skilled in intrigue. Now, Palestine, referring again to Israel, that area, Palestine has nothing to do with Philistines. There are no Palestine or Palestinian DNA. There's no such thing. A true Palestinian is a Jew or an Arab or a Christian. Because they all live in the land the whole period of time. There is no history, again, for uh, the Muslims... Islam, it doesn't come until about 700 A.D. There's no archaeology to, to prove anything that they own the land. It's all a hand of the devil distracting people until a certain time. Now, Palestine was under the control of the Ptolemies of Egypt at first, a long series of, of battles again uh, under Antiochus. The third and the great 
And again, a great look, he took it in, in 198 BC. Again, the, the conquering, this whole thing is about battle and battle and battle, fighting for power. Is it any different today? You know how many years of peace there's been in the whole world since the world began? Less than 400 years. Man has been battling power and control. Antiochus, he comes to power again. He becomes this picture of this Antichrist. He, he gains the throne by intrigue. He was not a real heir even to the throne. Look with me in verse 24. His power will be mighty, but not his own power. He will destroy extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and, and the holy place. See, Antiochus began uh, to rule, rather began with this weak kingdom, but he attained such great power in, in the conquer in his military conquest. This great power was, again, not his own power. God was the one that was allowing him the power. Remember, God's the one that raises up, and God's the one that brings down. God would use it to humble again and revive the Jewish people. God would use him in the rebellion during the Maccabean revolt to wake up part of that nation that had, had drifted into apostasy. It's not God's power, really, but God allows Satan's power. God could stop it, but God allows it and he uses it for good. So behind all these demonic leaders and they're demonic, and most people say that Hitler was demonic, he certainly was. Who is the power behind? Satan, in every case. Antiochus' power was employed for evil purposes. It was not God, but Satan's power, a prince of darkness, especially expressed in the, in the fact that he would be a picture of that Antichrist. Many believe that he would do it because he comes into the, the sanctuary and sacrifices a pig. Not just one pig, many pigs. Raising up an altar of Zeus, leading many Jewish people. Many Jewish people followed him in this when he desecrated the temple. It's surprising. But it shows you where their walk was. See, these Jewish people are just like Christians today. There are those that are always on the perimeter, on the outside, never plugged in. Like the children of Israel when they're going through the wilderness for 40 years. And there were the stragglers. And the enemies always picked off the stragglers. These were the stragglers. Satan picked them off with the power of Antiochus. Look with me in verse 25 and and through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. And he will even oppose the princes, the prince of princes. But he be broken without a human agency. So the shrewdness. He, he's, a, he's a person that is... Again, he, he can speak in such a way that's, that draws people in. He's charismatic. He's a manipulator. But if things don't go his way, as we've seen in history, then he goes out, and there was something like 800,000 Jews were killed, including babies. And they found it a joy to do. You can see it's demonic. Antiochus would practice deceit. He would lie to prosper, to be successful. We know people around us probably 
that are doing the same thing. And these are, this is just painting a picture of the Antichrist, but much more than just this, that will deceive the whole world. If it's possible, Second Thessalonians talked about if it was possible even to deceive the lacked. Unless you stay plugged in, focused upon Jesus, you could be one of those. Because people are confident in their mind, but their, their heart, their spirit is not connecting with God. There are many people I know that they start with God. They start in the front row, and then they work their way back. Don't sit in the back next time. And then further back, and, and eventually they're out the door, and they're doing what they did before. Quite a common pattern for people. They start well, but they fail. A choice they make. This man is going to exalt himself, just as the Antichrist will exalt himself and desecrate the temple, declaring himself God. You can follow again Revelation 13. You can go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You can see it all lines out perfectly. That's why it's a, like a double fulfillment. He's doing all these things. But it's not a complete fulfillment because it's really talking about the Antichrist that will come during the tribulation. In the beginning of that great tribulation, it parallels perfectly. Antiochus coins, uh, they had the phrase on it, God manifest. He thought himself as, as being God, God in the flesh. I mean, that's what the Antichrist will claim when he comes. He worshipped Zeus, a god who embodied military strength, but all these gods were still just the Greek gods. And what's interesting is, again, this passage is that Antiochus will abandon the gods of his father. Now people take that passage to mean everything and he's going to be a Jew. This just simply means that he wants was a person who had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. And as you see, chose to be God. So he leads these people astray again. And who does he lead astray? Apostate Jews. What is apostate again? It mean falling away. How do you know you're falling away if you're not moving forward? If you're not praying before a meal or after a meal, and that's what you used to do. If you're not reading and all of a sudden you're making excuses, I'm just so busy, I, I can't spend time with God, I don't have time to prayer. You're backsliding. You're moving in that way of a apostate. You begin making all the excuses for not walking with God, staying focused upon God. And then the next thing that comes is a person says, well, I really don't need him. I'm doing fine on my own. And God lets you do that and, and, and allows you to fall and giving you an opportunity to look back up. But they're going to try and save themselves on their own power. You try and save your life, you'll lose your life. But if you lose your life for Jesus Christ, then you'll find your life. The pigs were sacrificed on the altar. The statue of Zeus was set up. Circumcision and the observance of the Sabbath and the Jewish feasts were forbidden. And there were those that would rebel. And that would be the Maccabean revolt. But, but for the most part, it was okay. And that's what's going to happen in this country. In the other countries, as persecution comes, you know, it is a separating the church. God's testing, and then he's separating the true church from the false church. In every church, every congregation, those are true believers and those are false believers. Copies of the Hebrew Bible were destroyed. And when I talk about copies, I'm not talking about the, the Bible like I have here. Scrolls, 30 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet, burned, destroyed. Could you burn the word of God? But sometimes we take the Bible and we get home and we just kind of throw it out on the, on the couch. Oops, missed, fell on the floor. 
Do we really value the Word of God? See, these are things that are like red flags. When a Jewish person goes into the house, and, and not saying they're holy, but they, they have a little scroll right on the front door, and they kiss it. The Word of God is like honey to our lips. It's a light unto our path. And when a person no longer is focusing on it, no longer using it as a mirror to their own life, they're on that path to destruction. See, we, we can be a hearer of the word, but not a doer of the word. That's talking about apostate. It's so easy to say the correct words. But what's your life like? What does the world see? And there were so many that were turning away. And this is what's going to happen during the tribulation. Because they want to save their life. They'll take the mark of the beast. And they give in. Two mothers circumcised their baby sons and soldiers of Antiochus drove them from the city and threw them off over the wall of, for death. Do you realize how evil the people were at that time? And, and, and this is only giving us a glimpse. It's bad. We think this is horrible, but the, the tribulation is going to be so much worse than this. Who would want to be there? When the children of Israel came in, to the promised land. God says you have to eradicate again all the people. They've come to that point of no return, if you remember. And they had to kill the, the fathers, the mothers, and the children in this case. Because if you don't, you will do the same things that they do. Now that key is the point of no return. They had turned against God completely. There was no hope of salvation anymore. God knows the heart. It wasn't long that again the Israelites were sacrificing their own children for prosperity. Fulfilling the scripture. These things will happen again. Antiochus went too far from the little village of Modin. It's, it's, it's still there today. Not a little village, it's an area religious community there. Matthias and five other sons rose up and led a guerrilla warfare against Antiochus. The third son, Judas, Hebrew is Judah, took the lead and became known as the Maccabee. The hammer. There were some that stood for righteousness when they desecrated the temple. Many Jews rallied for the, the cause. Judas died in the battle. His brother Jonathan was made high priest and governor of Judea. Later, Antiochus died of a disease. Antiochus lived 400 years again before, or excuse me, after the, after the time of Daniel, and before Christ. And before Christ came, catch this, is very important, there were 400 years of silence. There wasn't one prophet. It spoke about how the Hebrew people began to drift and drift and drift, yet God was going to keep every promise. And he did. Here it should be noted that the writer claimed to be really predicting the future. He knew it was the future. It was the end time. The prophecy cannot be true as Gabriel declared, some people say, unless it actually was delivered by Daniel. And when they try and explain it away, it was delivered by Daniel. Written down, recorded. Many years before the event, look with me in verse 26, the vision of the evening and mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days of the future. 
See, Gabriel was affirming the vision was true. It, it would not be fulfilled in Daniel's lifetime. It was a partial fulfillment in, in, in 400 years later, but it'd be 2,000 years later before it's completely filled. God would continue to reach and save people, Jews and Gentiles alike, that whole period of time. Gabriel instructed Daniel, but keep the vision a secret. It, it, it doesn't mean that he is to hide it. Oftentimes in our language, that's how it comes, comes across, but, but to preserve it, to write it down, to keep it. We're going to see when we get to chapter 12, we see the same thing. Seal up. Meaning to keep it, preserve it. Because when we get to the end times, the, the understanding of it, now we look back at the history and say, oh, wow, 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 this is all true. It's, uh, it's all accurate. And, and, and what's left to be fulfilled, it must be fulfilled. This was literally fulfilled. This will be literally fulfilled. And yet there's so many trying to explain it away. Or say it's just a story of good and evil. It is a story of good and evil. That is true. But they're literal events that will happen. Because the hardness of man's heart. God's patient. He's long-suffering. So Daniel is to, to record it, to keep it. Now, in the future, it says the 2300 days. There's been all kinds of prophecies around it. I talked about some that, that were given last week. And it's mornings and evenings. It speaks about the last half of the tribulation. It's called that great tribulation. Look with me in verse 27. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. And then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astonished at the vision. And there was none to explain it. No one else would understand it. Now, first thing I want to call attention to in verse 27 is really important. Daniel was just exhausted and sick for days, overwhelmed. And when things happen in life, crisis, they, they happen. And people will be sick and they'll be overwhelmed. And this is a normal situation in life because we are weak and we are human. But there's something else important. Daniel said, then I got up again and carried on the king's business. Whatever happens in your life or my life in the past, we got to move on. This is the only way that you and I ever honor God is to, is to move on. You have to let the past be the past. Learn from that past. Set up your healthy boundary, whatever you need to do. Because if you don't, that becomes your identity. And you miss the things that God has for you and, and miss being used by God. And there's a joy in being used by God. Daniel did not understand the timing of the events, the, the full implication, really. It, it, it was just overwhelming. But as if one day he just said, enough is enough, I've got to go on. Fear will paralyze you. The pain, you'll hurt someone. You see, hurting people hurt others. God is our strength and God is our rock. But the past is past. So Daniel, I love this, is Daniel is exhausted. He's sick for days, but he moves on. You see this picture through the Bible. You see, Daniel, when Daniel sinned, or not Daniel, excuse me, but David sinned and he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Tried to hide his sin and finally when it all came out and he would lose the baby that, was, that she would have. He wept, mourned, but then he got up and washed his face and moved on. God still has a life for you and me to live. And we can't live in the past. So he rose up, took up his duties in the king's court. And for us, it's, again, we move on. We serve the Lord. The message still needs to go out. They're still hurting people. 
Notice again, the, again, the, the queen mother had to tell Belshazzar uh, about him because here's Daniel, he's the one that moves on and, and yet some people are just going through life and don't know anything. You're going to learn. God's going to show you things. God's going to reveal things. But as you continue to walk, God will show you step by step. He had not been transported to the location of the vision, remember. He had only seen it in his mind. He never went there. He was appalled by the vision because he could not really understand it. I've had dreams, and I'm sure you've had dreams. They just don't make sense. Don't let this world overwhelm you. Now, I want to finish with this. Antiochus is a type of antichrist. Symbolized by the horns, the, the little, the small, the beginning. Again, just like the antichrist. He was a ruthless king. The antichrist will have an imposing look. And you know the story on that. Was the master's intrigue. Again, the, the brilliance of the Antichrist is suggested with his eyes of the horn. Again, he had great power. The Antichrist will even have greater power. And he was energized by Satan. Destroy thousands, the anti Antichrist will destroy more if you read Revelation 13 than you can even imagine. Prospered for a short time, Antiochus did. Likewise, the Antichrist, three and a half years, his rule is limited to. Persecuted Jews, just as the Antichrist persecuted Jews, and they'll run off to Petra, many people believe. Antiochus was a, a deceiver. The Antichrist is called a master deceiver. Antiochus was proud, arrogant. So, so was the Antichrist and, 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 uh, and uh, Antiochus the same. Blaspheme God, so does the Antichrist. He was not killed by human hands. The Antichrist will not be killed by human hands either. But by the very word of God. Well, let me finish with this last verse. I've already read it. Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 4. God, after he had spoken long ago to the fathers in many prophets and many portions in many ways... In these last days he's spoken to us in his son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through whom he's made the world. He is the radiance of glory, the exact representation of the nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of his sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become much better than angels. He inherited a more excellent name than they. This is our king, greater than you and I could ever, ever imagine in this world. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for a text that shows us the future. Lord, we know that our future is really in your hands. Lord, we look to you to to guide us, to strengthen us, to give us wisdom, to give us direction. And Lord, in your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.